Well, the New Testament tells us, as we've pointed out before on the, in this uh, series in the life of Elijah, the New Testament tells us that he, is, he was a, a man of like passions uh, as we are. Uh, literally, the word that James uses when he says that is uh, uh, he, uh, he, he experiences the same pathos. That's literally the word that he uses in the Greek. We get our word pathos from there. Uh, he knew the same feelings, the same temptations, the same struggles and difficulties that we go through in our uh, lives and in the Christian walk. Uh, but so far in the story of Elijah, uh, we would have to say that it's been a bit difficult to, to see that, isn't it? Um, you'd be forgiven so far for thinking perhaps that Elijah was some kind of superman. He bursts onto the scene, doesn't he, with fearlessness and bravery, and he stands before King Ahab, this wicked king, and Jezebel, the queen who has put to death many of the, the Lord's people, and particularly prophets and here is this prophet and he stands before Ahab and Jezebel and says there shall be neither rain nor dew on the ground except at my word. Uh, he comes fearlessly and boldly onto the scene. We've seen haven't we in the in the home of the widow of Zarephath what a godly man this is, this really is. We've seen also, haven't we, that this man is, is someone who's got power in prayer. We were thinking of that uh, just, uh, was it last week or the week before? The, this godly man and the power that he knew in prayer. And so it's difficult to see, perhaps, when we just see those things so far, uh, that he's really just a man like, like you and me, and that he's a man of like passions, as it were. Well, here in chapter 19, we finally come to see the evidence for that statement that James uh, wrote. After what has to be viewed as the greatest victory of his life, the very moment that he's been working towards for years, after Carmel and the victory that he, 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 he enjoys on that mountaintop, the very next day he, he has a nervous breakdown. You have to describe it in that way, don't you? He seems to show all of the symptoms of someone who is suffering here from severe depression. He hears the message from Queen Jezebel in those first in the first couple of verses, you notice. He hears this message from Jezebel the Queen, and he falls apart in a moment. You can just imagine. Sometimes, well, it's, you know, we're not meant to speculate, but I think it's right to use our imagination sometimes in the, in the word of God. And you can, you can just imagine uh, Elijah there in front of the palace and this great victory has been won and Ahab has just come home and he's, he's explaining to his wife, Jezebel, everything that's gone on in Mount Carmel. We read that verse one, don't we? And you can just imagine Elijah standing there expecting something wonderful to happen, something some great announcement to take place. And instead, she sends a messenger with a threat. It's a death threat. She sends a messenger to Elijah. And you can almost imagine her standing on the balcony of the palace, perhaps just doing that kind of thing. You're a dead man. And what happens? He runs for his life. His world comes crashing down around him. And he runs, we're told, to Beersheba in verse 3, which was 100 miles away from Jezreel. There he finds a tree in the wilderness, a broom tree or a juniper tree. And he crawls underneath this tree. And I, again, can't help using my imagination, just wondering whether he's didn't sort of adopt the fetal, fetal position and just cry out. He wants to die. He asks the Lord to take his life from him. What a change from the day before. 
What a change from everything that we've seen so far. Where's all the bravery and the boldness now? Where's all that gone? And this event, this chapter, these, these verses come to us, don't they? As some, some, well, in some form of surprise, really. They come as a, as a shock to us. They, they are the last thing that we would expect from a man of God like Elijah. But we shouldn't be shocked. Should we? Because as we often say, and as we said in the men's meeting yesterday, the best of men are just men at best. And so Elijah's fall here into depression and his running for his life and his asking is almost suicidal, isn't it? He asks the Lord to take his life away. And, you know, it we, we comes as a shock to us because of everything else we've seen. But, you know, it shouldn't come as a shock, really. Job, he cursed the day of his birth. Jeremiah did something very similar. Jonah, at the end of the book of Jonah, he says, Oh, Lord, please take my life from me. Even the Apostle Paul in the New Testament says, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired even of life itself, he says. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to us that a man of God like this should fall in this way. Even Spurgeon, the great, the great Spurgeon, he knew terrible bouts of depression in his life. Spiritual people can sometimes fall so low and can suffer in a terrible way. And sometimes that can take place even after some great spiritual achievement. That's exactly what happens here, isn't it? This should have been the best day of his life in many ways, shouldn't it? He's been on the mountaintop the day before and now he's in the valley of the shadow of death or to put it in the words of John Bunyan the day before he's been on the delectable mountains and now he's in the slough of despond isn't he so I want to look with you this morning at this event this this moment this time that Elijah spent in this terrible depression that he suffered and learned what we can uh, from it uh, this morning and there's three things I want to do with you this morning I want to describe first of all something of the characteristics the characteristics of this uh, this depression and then secondly I want to think about the causes of it and then finally just very briefly at the end we'll see something of the cure and then we'll go on next week to see uh, see something else when uh, as it goes on because it's it's connected the next few verses aren't they uh, the next section as well, but that's what we're that's where we're going this morning. The characteristics, the causes, and the cure. Uh, so let's uh, let's think about the characteristics, the character of his depression. What did his depression look like? Well, let me just underline three things briefly as we we look at this uh, this uh, portion. First of all, his Depression was puzzling. Let me put it that way. His depression was pu puzzling. You see what I mean? Look at, uh, look at what triggered it. Look at what happened. Verses 2 and 3. See what he says. Uh, then Jezebel sent a messenger to, a to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more so, more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, the false prophets, by this time, tomorrow she says now what's that well you've got to say that it was an idle threat wasn't it it uh, it really is an idle threat because if uh, Elijah had sat down and thought about this threat uh, well he, I'm sure he would have seen uh, if it was you know in his right mind as it were if he could sit, sit down and analyze it and think about it then I'm sure he would have seen that it was simply that an idle an idle threat because quite simply 
You don't warn someone if you really intend to kill them, do you? I mean, I've never, I've never had that intention, so you know, I imagine you haven't either. But you know, it's a, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit crazy, isn't it, to send someone uh, a warning? You know, you don't phone someone up and say, "I'm coming around your house in a minute, and I'm, you know, I'm going to do you in," kind of thing. You don't do that, do you? If you're really intending to kill someone, well, you use deceit and guile and deception, don't you? You you use stealth to creep up on them and surprise them, perhaps. You don't ring them up first. If this threat was real, surely she wouldn't have sent a messenger. She'd have simply sent an assassin. She'd have simply sent her, her elite troops, the the guards, perhaps, the best swordsmen in the land or whatever it might have been. But she wouldn't have sent a messenger. But you see, she's a shrewd woman, isn't she? Because for now, at least, at this moment, Elijah is a little bit of a national hero all of a sudden. He's been the villain, hasn't he, of the, of the piece beforehand. Are you the troubler of Israel, Ahab says to him when he sees him. But now, well, you, you, you see back at the back in chapter 18 and verse 49, you see what it says at the end of, uh, uh, towards the end of uh, Carmel, sorry, not 49, um, I think it's 39, isn't it? Verse 39, it says, And when all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And the, Elijah's the only prophet left. And so, Elijah is a little bit of a, a national hero, for a moment at least. If she were to literally try and kill him now, well, she might face a rebellion in the nation. No, she wants to intimidate him, doesn't she? She wants to shut him up and get him out of the way. So she sends this messenger with this threat, and it works. He runs 100 miles. You can just imagine him running those 100 miles, can't you? looking over his shoulder all the time, wondering if there's anyone on his back kind of thing. A hundred miles, four marathons almost. And he just goes and goes and runs and runs until he can't stop, until he can't run anymore either. And uh, it's this idle threat really that triggers, triggers this panic and this fear and this depression. Fear has taken hold of the man. Now, can you understand why I say his depression then was puzzling? Because it was so unlike him, wasn't it? It's, his reaction is out of all proportion to the idle threat that he meets. And so he's so different now from the man that we see in the, uh, the first you know, couple of chapters of his life in chapter 17, and 18. It, it doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't seem to fit this great man of God, this great man of faith and of power in prayer. What's he doing now? He's running away and hiding under a, an, under a broom tree. It's all, it all seems so irrational. And I think it's good for us to remember that. It's good, good for us to notice that. You know, sometimes when we're in, we're in a kind of a, a state of mind like this, all, well, small kind of issues, they can become everything, can't they? They can be some, become so big to us. So big that they take over and they're all that we can see. We can so easily tend to make mountains out of molehills at certain times in our lives. I remember back in uh, our time when we were in the church in Coventry and uh, I just happened to be speaking to someone. It was the end of the meeting and people were going home and so uh, I was speaking to someone and couldn't really sort of you know get out of the conversation as it were and another man that I knew very well and I'd sp spoken to him many times he was passing and he, he sort of signaled goodbye he didn't want to interrupt so he, he didn't he just signaled goodbye and I don't know why I do, did it because I've never done it well I don't know I don't tend to do it very much very often but I just sort of went like that kind of thing you know just sort of a, a little bit of a salute and say bye in that kind of way well he stopped talking to me, <laughs> and for the next few weeks he was uh, in a bit of a, a bit of a mood, and you know, really down. And, and I found it really. I thought, what, what have I done? I, I didn't know. And, you know anyway, after a couple of weeks, I, I approached him and I said, "Look, have I, have I upset you? You stopped talking to me." And he said, "You saluted me." I said, "What's wrong with that?" 
And of course, it all came out then that at work, he was, he was a boss in his company and the uh, people that he was in charge of, they viewed him as a bit of a sergeant major. And so behind his back, and he knew it, uh, sometimes they would sort of be doing this kind of thing. And he thought I was doing the same. Well, I wasn't for one moment. But you see the thing, just a, a little thing, a, a molehill, really. And it became a mountain to him. And, you know, we, 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 we need to understand these things, don't we? We need to some, sometimes understand that small things can take on massive proportions. And it can all be so irrational at times. And so it did with Elijah. It's puzzling, isn't it? Why he ends up like this. I mean, if you compare verse 2 with verse 4, you'll see something, something else of this irrational nature of, the, of his depression. And she says to him, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. And then he runs a hundred miles, and he gets under the tree, and he asks the Lord that he might die. <laughs> He's running because he doesn't want to die, and then when he gets there, he says, Lord, I want to die. I mean, how do you understand that? Just these things, you see, it, it doesn't make sense, and there's a there's a puzzling aspect to it, but I think we need to be aware of that kind of thing, don't we? And we need to be patient with one another. And sometimes these things can hit us and uh, maybe no one else understands what's going on. It all seems so puzzling, but deep inside, there's a reason, as we'll, we'll see as we go on this morning. So first of all, it's puzzling. But then secondly, let me just say it's paralyzing as well, isn't it, this depression? Look at verses five, 3 to 5. Uh, then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, it's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. He withdraws from all company, doesn't he? He wants to get utterly alone. He even leaves his servant behind in three, doesn't he? He leaves his servant. And Elijah goes under this broom tree and becomes inactive. There's an inertia about him now. He curls up, as it were, and goes into a shell. And you can just picture him there under the tree. It was a desert land. It's a wilderness, we read in verse 4. But he sees a tree and crawls under it and wants to die. Now, again, isn't that just typical so often of depression? It takes us into a wilderness and takes away... All our zest for life. And it's so sad to see, isn't it? Elijah hits rock bottom at this point. He doesn't even want to live. And he doesn't want to talk to anybody, does he? That's the sad thing so often about depression, isn't it? He doesn't even want to talk to anybody. You know, if, we, if any of us were there, if we saw him there under the tree and heard him praying like, this I'm sure we'd want to sort of sidle up alongside him and put her up on an arm around him and say you know come on Elijah you know we'd want to talk to him to try and help him but I tell you what I tell you something he wouldn't want to talk to you and very often when people are in this kind of a state of mind they they just want to get away from everybody they don't want to talk to anybody and, they, and that's that's the sad thing surely that so often happens, it isolates and it renders us, renders the sufferer inactive. It's, it has a paralyzing effect upon Elijah. And it's so sad, isn't it, to think of what might have happened if this hadn't taken place. Just imagine what Elijah might have accomplished next. I know it's not good to speculate and we mustn't do that of course, but you perhaps can imagine just a little bit if he, if he had managed to avoid this and follow up on the victory of Carmel. If it had perhaps gone throughout the land, all these people who were crying, 
The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. If he had then been able to go up to these people and preach and tell them about this God that they had been rejecting for so long, if he had managed to preach in that way, well, we don't know what could have happened. But, you know, we need to realise, don't we, that our moods and our state of mind can very often affect our service and can affect the cause of Christ. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. So he intimidates and shuts him up. And then lastly, this characteristics, it's pernicious as well. It's puzzling, it's paralyzing, and it's pernicious. Look at verse 4, he, he curls up as it were and he asks the Lord to take away his life. Someone has said that this was the only prayer that Elijah ever prayed that God never answered. Thank God he didn't. Thank God for unanswered prayer. It's a, it's an, it's a prayer that he never answered. Elijah, you remember, at the end of the story, he goes up into glory in the chariots of fire. Remember? He's one of only two people in the whole of the Old Testament that never died. Of course, the other one is Enoch. But his prayer is unanswered. And we, you know, should give thanks. You know, very often in the prayer meetings, we, we encourage ourselves when we've seen an answer to our prayers. And so we, so we should, that's good. But, you know, sometimes we ought to sort of step back and praise God for unanswered prayers as well, maybe. Uh, he knows best, doesn't he? And uh, what an inglorious end it would have been for Elijah if God had answered his prayer right there and then. He'd have been found by someone someday under that broom tree, perhaps, or in a ditch somewhere. What a terrible end that would have been. But God had something far better for Elijah. And sometimes our prayers are unanswered because God has got something far better for us. And we need to bear that in mind, don't we? I think it's amazing when you compare Enoch and Elijah together. You know, we can understand that Enoch, can't we, in a sense, was taken up to glory. He never died. You know, he's described as, as someone who, who walked with the Lord. And it's almost as though he went out for a walk with the Lord. And, and one afternoon, the Lord said, well, you might as well come home with me then. You know, And so he just took him up and he was never seen again. What a wonderful picture it is of, of, of Enoch going up into heaven. This wonderful man of God who walked with the Lord in such a wicked time as he was living. But Elijah, well here he's, he's almost suicidal, isn't he? He wants to die. But God says no. No. In fact, never. <laughs> You're coming home with me. I think it's, uh, it's uh, the characteristics really are, are, are so sad, really, when you, when you look at these things, puzzling, paralyzing, and pernicious. They can render us inactive. But let's, let's think then for a moment about the causes of, uh, of this depression as well. How did, how did it happen? Why did Elijah crash in the way that he did here? Well, again, there's a number of indicators in the passage. Let me just underline them uh, briefly as we go through. Uh, first of all, there was a physical reason, a physical cause to his depression and his fall here. You think about everything that he's been through so far. Think about the tension that we mentioned when we were looking at that event on Mount Carmel. Uh, just think about the stress that he was under. One man, alone, against the nation. One man standing up against this wicked king, Ahab, and his wife, Jezebel. All the prayer that was involved in the preaching and the, all the stress that it, was, that it involved. And then in chapter 18 and verse 46, we read that, that Elijah ran before the chariot of Ahab to the, ch to the entrance of Jezreel. That was, uh, that was 18 miles 18 miles in front of a chariot, and now he runs for 100 miles in fear. Well, can't you see what's happening? This man's worn out, isn't he? He's, uh, 
he's come to the end of himself. Physically, he's just uh, on his last uh, breath, as it were. And so what happens? Well, God puts him to bed. I love the, I love the picture here. It's wonderful, isn't it? That God simply puts him to bed, verses 5 and 6. And he sends this angel, we're told, to touch him. And he says, arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. What's, uh, what's all that about? Well, uh, to put it mildly, let me just sort of say it in this way, first of all. Uh, that's breakfast in bed, isn't it? Breakfast in bed for, his, for his, uh, his servant Elijah. He was exhausted. And now God comes and this angel serves him. And then again, he puts him to sleep and he does it again. Arise and eat. Because I'm sending you on holiday this time. He says at the end of the passage, I'm sending you to Horeb. The journey's too far for you, but I'm, you're going away. You know, he says, what is it, verse 7, he says, uh, arise and eat for the journey is too far for you. And you think, well, what, what journey? Where am I going? Well, he's going on a six weeks holiday. Wow. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, it's exactly what Elijah needed, you see, because he's absolutely exhausted. And he goes on this holiday and there's no preaching and there's no confrontation. There's no threats. There's no stress. It's just rest, rest. How Gentle, our God is with his people, isn't he? What a tender, compassionate, loving, heavenly father we have. He knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. We're not just spiritual, are we? We're physical as well. And there's a physical aspect to this fall. Elijah is exhausted and so God gives him a complete break. Well then, secondly, it's not only physical because there's a psychological aspect to his, uh, to his depression as well, isn't there? A psychological aspect. The strain, just imagine the strain of being alone all this time. And he was, wasn't he? Elijah was a bit of a loner, it seems. And uh, ever since the beginning of the story, when he confronts Ahab, uh, and then he goes off to the brook, Cherith, you remember, he's absolutely alone. He's utterly alone. And then on Mount Carmel, you remember, he says it himself in Mount Carmel in chapter 18 and verse 22. He says to the people of Israel, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, the Baal's prophets of 450 men. He's, he feels Utterly alone. And then he says it again here in verse, verse 10. I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. It's a phrase that he keeps on using. I, even I, only am left. He didn't have a friend. And that is so valuable, isn't it? It's impossible to overstate the importance of real Christian friends. Not just passing fellowship after a service on a Sunday morning. That's good. But friendship. Deep, meaningful Friendship, someone that you can rely on, someone that you can call on, someone that you can open yourself up to. We should never underestimate the value of that. Even the Lord Jesus Christ chose 12 apostles. And we think, well, yeah, of course he did. You know, he, he chose them to go out and preach and to become the solid foundation of the church and they were going to write them. There's so many reasons for him choosing these 12. Do you know there's a part in the scripture in the New Testament where it simply tells us that he chose the 12 to be with him. If our saviour, the perfect man, needed fellowship, do you think you can get away, on your, away with it on your own? We need to seek out meaningful fellowship, don't we? 
Charles Kinsley was a, a great reformer and uh, pushed for the uh, for laws regarding workers' rights and so on. Uh, it was a bit out of his time because he came before all of that kind of thing happened. It was it was later really that it all came into being. But he was someone who fought for these things. But he was a he lived a wonderful Christian happy life. And someone said to him, uh, someone asked him one day, "What's the secret to your happy life?" And he simply said, I had a friend. I had a friend. Someone said, friendship doubles our joys and halves all our sorrows. So true, isn't it? It's so important, isn't it? Not only to seek out friendship, but it's so important and a responsibility that each, each one of us has as believers and as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a responsibility that we have to be a friend. That's true for all of us. It's not good to sit at home and just click on a, click on a screen. And enjoy the ministry that way. Well, that's good. Okay, then fine. I'm not going to, I'm not putting that down. But we need fellowship, friendship. We need one another. So there's a physical aspect and a psychological aspect. And then thirdly, there's a spiritual aspect or a spiritual cause of this depression as well. Look at verse three. It says, uh, then he was afraid and he rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, where, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. Now, if you're reading the authorised version, you will know that there's a difference there in the translation at the beginning of verse 3. It says, when he saw that, he arose and ran. When he saw that, and you have to think, well, when he saw what? <laughs> what did he see? Was it the message? Was that written? perhaps from the from this for Jezebel uh, did he see her gesture on the on the balcony as it were threatening him with death what did he see well I'm tempted to think and I, I believe this is right really that uh, what he see what he sees here is uh, it's, it's not referring it's, it's like the the hearing of the rain last week remember the hearing of the rain he, he saw something here that caused him to run. What was it? Well, let, let me put it like this. Up until now, the only thing that he could see was the glory of his God, wasn't it? He keeps on saying over and over again, in whom, uh, before whom I stand. He talks about this God of Israel, Jehovah, before whom I stand. He keeps on saying that. But now you see his eyes are looking at something else. If I, you, remember the, you remember the story of Peter walking on the water and he gets out of the boat and he walks across the water towards the Lord Jesus. And then the, then the story says, and when he saw the waves, he began to sink. Well, he saw the waves before, didn't he? Of course he did. He'd been on boats for years. He knew what it was like. He knew what waves were all about. But you see, for that time, all he can see is the Lord Jesus. And that's enough to make him get out of the boat and walk on the water. But then when he takes his eyes off him for a moment and he sees the waves, then he begins to sink. Now there's something like that, I think, going on here in this, in this passage. Before he sees only the glory of the Lord, before whom I stand. But now he, he's taken his eyes away. He's taken his eyes off, off the Lord and he sees her and her threats and that seems to fill his horizon and it's the only thing he can see now. So you see what I mean? There's a spiritual aspect to it as well. He, he took his eyes off the Lord. And that's why God sends him to Horeb in verse 8. And we'll see that next week. But he sends him off to Horeb. Really what's going on there in the next passage in verses 19 uh, 9 and following is, is really a spiritual retreat. It's a church holiday on his own. It's a spiritual retreat for six weeks. It's a, it's a refresher course. Mount Horeb. Think of all the things that had happened at Mount Horeb. 
And God sends him there as a great reminder of the, of the works that God has done in the past. So we have sung in one of our hymns this morning, His love in time past forbids me to think He'll leave me at last in trouble to sink. Each sweet Ebenezer I have in review confirms his good pleasure to see me quite through. That's why God sends him to Horeb. He wants to remind him of all the good things that God has done in the past. To remind him and to get him to see that he's not going to abandon him now. He won't leave him alone. And so there's these different aspects, these causes of, the, uh, of this depression. But let me just say very, very briefly at the end, uh, let me just say for a, a few, few minutes, the, uh, point you to the, core, the cure of this depression. Let me point you to the cure. We've already seen part, if, you can, if I uh, can say it, uh, we've already seen part of the cure. I mean, God gives him rest, sends him to sleep, he... Uh, Wakes him up with food ready so he doesn't have to do anything to get it. It's just there and he eats and then he goes back to sleep. And then he, uh, he sends him on a holiday and then later on he's going to give him a friend. Because in verses 19 the, we, we read of the call of Elisha. He gives him a, a friend. And so the, all of these things are aspects of the cure. And as I say we'll see something more of that next time. But let me just focus on one thing as we come to a close this morning what was the what was really the heart of the matter the cure for Elijah without putting down without wanting to uh, take away the importance of the these other aspects what was the real cure for Elijah surely it was a rediscovery of the nearness of God it was a, a new vision of the Lord wasn't it He runs away from Jezebel a hundred miles. But when he gets there in the wilderness and under the brood tree, God is there. He's still there. And doesn't it remind us of, our, of uh, Psalm 139? Where shall I go from your presence, Lord? If I go up into the, mount, into, the, into the heavens, you're there. If I go down into the depths, you're there. You know, it, uh, the omnipresence of God. And Elijah is reminded of that here, isn't he? He's uh, reminded of the omnipresence of God. That God is still there with him right there in the wilderness. But notice, as we close, notice the way in which God comes to him and speaks to him and ministers to him. You notice how it's very, very specific and very important, isn't it? In verse 5, we read, And he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold... An angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. But then we go on in verse 7, and you see a little bit more. It says, And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Who's, the, who's this angel of the Lord? You know, don't you? You know where I'm going. Who is the angel of the Lord? Well, if you know your Old Testament, you'll know very, very well that the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's the second person of the Trinity. I'm not going to spend time now going through that, but you look it up. You look into that. This angel, the angel of the Lord, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Isn't that amazing? It's beautiful. In the book of Isaiah, we read that Isaiah saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. The voices of those who call out, holy, 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 the thresholds of the temple shook. He gives, he's given a vision of the glory and the holiness of God there in Isaiah chapter 6, isn't he? And John tells us in the New Testament, he saw Christ. It was Jesus sitting on the throne. 
And now that Jesus, who is worshipped and adored by all the holy angels, he gets down off the throne and he comes to a wilderness and he draws near to this man who just wants to die. And he bakes him a cake and prepares him a jug of water. Oh, the compassion of our God. Oh, the tenderness of our Saviour. He doesn't just send an angel. He comes to minister to this man. What condescension, what tenderness. Do you see the point? Are you feeling low? Do you know times, perhaps, bouts of depression? More than just blue days, perhaps. We all got that, don't we? But do you know what I mean? Are you, do you feel low at times? Do you feel sometimes that you're unable to keep going? That you could just be ready to give it all up, to throw in the towel? I've had enough, Lord. Lord, take me away. I've finished. I don't want to go on another day. Do you feel like that sometimes? Elijah did. But all the time, the angel watched over him, even while he was asleep. Or the care of our Saviour, who humbles himself, not only to bake a cake, but to go to the cross and die for us. No wonder that the, the, the Bible tells us a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not snuff out. You, can, you might feel like a bruised reed, a smoking flax. I want to reassure you this morning of the love of God and the nearness of your Saviour. Oh, look to him and find strength in your time of need. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray.